thank you all for joining uh, our panel discussion. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the Yale New Haven Health System and Yale School of Medicine AI partnerships. My name is Wade Schultz. I'm an assistant professor in laboratory medicine and uh, secondary appointment in biomedical informatics. Uh, along with our health system uh, IT partners, I also help oversee a large portion of our informatics infrastructure, primarily focused on data science and AI initiatives. Uh, we've got a great panel here today, including uh, Dr. Lee Schwamm, who is our Associate Dean of Digital Strategy and Transformation, as well as our Chief Digital Health Officer for Yale New Haven Health. Uh, Alan Shaw, who is a uh, Professor of Pediatrics and Emergency Medicine, as well as our Chief Medical Information Officer for Yale New Haven Health. And Daniela Meeker, who is an Associate Professor of Biomedical Informatics and our Chief Research Information Officer. Uh, to start off today, I'm going to actually have each of our panelists just give a brief overview of what their roles entail, as not all of you may be frequently exposed to them and know where people live within the different organizations. After that, I have a few topics to start off the discussion, but if anybody else has topics or questions, feel free to come up to either of the microphones and we can have the panelists answer those for us as well. Uh, I can maybe start with you on the end, uh, Dr. Chef. Thanks, Wade. Uh, so I'm the Chief Health Information Officer for the school and the system, as Wade noted, and faculty in pediatrics mercy medicine. Uh, actually, I work uh, under the uh, leadership diet of Dr. Schwamm and Lisa Stump, who's our CIO, basically kind of helping uh, provide support for our entire IT infrastructure that support our hospital and health system, as well as School of Medicine clinical operations. And so I like to thank often I'm, I'm the Chief Apology Officer, apologizing to our, our faculty, <laughs> Uh, for Epic and how many clicks they have to do, how hard it is to get data out, um, but also have the, the the privilege of working with Daniela uh, in her role to also help make sure that we get the data information we need for our investigators, make sure we do it in a secure, co uh, compliant way. So a challenging, uh, but also fulfilling role uh, that, I, that I have the privilege of being in. Thank you, Alan. And it's a pleasure to work with, with both of you who I work with very closely. So I um, started my career as a stroke neurologist. I trained and practiced at the Mass General Brigham uh, Health System and Mass General Hospital for 30 years until arriving here just uh, in the spring of last year. In my role as the Chief Digital Health Officer, which is a new role for the hospital and, and, uh, the, and the university uh, combined, I'm one of a uh, growing number of in, individual leaders in the organization who, who, who truly have a foot in both sides of the street, so to speak. So anchored both in the School of Medicine and in the health system. And I think that's a really important transformation for the organization. And it, it comes under the term alignment. You may have heard that expression a lot, alignment and the aligned clinician enterprise. If if you think your job is the chief apology officer, I think it might be the might just be the chief zipper. Uh, my job is to try to again bring the sides together, interdigitate, and really unlock a lot of the value that exists in the current assets, but the the, but the the marketplace for the intersection of the ideas, the intellectual firepower, the health system uh, generated data, the the patient attributes, we really aren't capitalizing on a lot of that, and we need to transform how we think about the work and ultimately how we do the work of delivering patient care. If we're going to care for populations of patients, not just individual patients, and do it in a way that doesn't consume so much of the national. Uh, a gross domestic product, we don't have any money left over for the other really important uh, civic activities in our society. So I have the best job in the world, um, but it's not always the easiest job. I like how we uh, sat down on the stage with sort of Lee in the middle and, and me on one side and Alan, Alan on the other. It kind of works. So as the um, new position, the chief research information officer uh, is more towards serving the research community and facilitating the kind of the kind of transformation and translation that Lee was just describing. Uh, it is a new position. I think Alan had this as, as one of his uh, thirty jobs before before I arrived last year. And uh, a lot of a lot of what I do is to optimize some of the really fantastic groundwork that had already been laid by Alan. Um, the position is under uh, Lucilla Una Machado, the uh, deputy dean for biomedical informatics. In data science. I'm also faculty, as Wade mentioned, in, in bids. Um, we have three primary lines of service uh, that are part of what the researchers in, the, in our community have expressed as priority needs. So one of them that has been the, the, main, the main priority for the past uh, several months that I've been here is the um, 
JDAT and uh, data services that we've we've been trying to really streamline and work very closely with the compliance team. Uh, Charlie, you see you see here has has been a real key partner on on that as well. Um, I was recently, unfortunately, introduced as a member of our compliance team because I've been working so much with them. So I, I don't want to be confused uh, with uh, the fantastic uh, legal and IRB experts uh, that we work closely with. But part of the streamlining of those activities really involves that kind of a collaboration with with the regu regulatory uh, experts. Um, the other the other thing that I'm responsible for is. Uh, managing our portfolio of clinical research applications. So some of you may be familiar with things like our clinical trial management system and, and REDCap. They are systems with which people use to capture data, to manage uh, some of the operational components of, of research and especially clinical trials. And uh, and then finally, the the new the new uh, service line that we are working on is what I would call translational informatics or learning health system informatics. And those are the occasions where I I think that we'll be able to really make a difference by taking some of these early phase innovations and ultimately translate them into practice so that we can make the kinds of changes that I think all of us sort of see as a possibility in the future and operationalizing operationalizing all of all of your ideas. Great, thank you all. And uh, Alan, I'll pick on you again to maybe start this off since I know you'll have some of these answers uh, from some of the prior collaborations that we've done as well, uh, but maybe just highlight some of the successful implementations of AI that we've had between Yale University researchers as well as Yale New Haven Health System, and maybe trying to emphasize some of the integrations uh, where Epic has played a role in that. Uh, so, I mean, we have, uh, if, if you if you go back and kind of look at, think about AI's, uh, you know, umbrella of many different types of technology, and you include things like machine learning, uh, predictive models, uh, deep learning, uh, in addition to, of course, all, all the hype now with generative AI, um, but also re including robotic processing automation, um, Dr. Schwamm actually, uh, you know, kind of tasked us to kind of go back and do an inventory um, and we actually came up with over 90 things that actually we have in our in our clinical uh, you know uh, usage today. Everything, a lot of back office stuff uh, with helping with claims and things like that that our frontline faculty clinicians don't see. Uh, all the way to things where we are partnering with uh, Epic, for instance, uh, as bad rap they often get, uh, they are very forward thinking and and very much want to use generative AI. Uh, so so an example of that is we actually have I think 27, 28 uh, physicians now. Uh, and one nurse uh, using uh, ChatGPT in a secure, you know, cloud connected very securely to Epic through to actually uh, Epic's Nebula Cloud to our instance, uh, where it's in, it's reading in basket messages uh, for physicians and then drafting a response for them. And uh, we have a team of uh, you know medical informaticians uh, that that Lee and uh, and I lead. Uh, that actually have helped us fine tune the prompt engineering to help make sure that the AI isn't giving medical advice, but is actually just responding uh, in an appropriate way. And then, the, and then the physician then has to edit uh, before they, they actually then will click and send it forward. So uh, even that, you know, is is you know I think a type of uh, AI that's making a difference today that we hope to expand. Uh, and we have faculty who are very interested who've been helping studying it uh, and to uh, to measure the impact as well as you know the feasibility because we're finding about uh, you know 50 60 percent of the time it actually doesn't great give you a great response and and if you look at the patient messages and we've we've started looking at them like the messages that doctors get are just huge in range and in and in, 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 you know sometimes it's like one or two words and you have to figure out what the context is uh, to some of them are just you know paragraphs or you know part one part two part three and the patients will send multiple messages uh, and so it's so even the AI doesn't have a fighting chance with those but the feedback so far from the physicians have been uh, that when it, you know the forty percent time it is helpful, they're very grateful for it because it does save them a lot of typing uh, what patients have uh, shared. Uh, locally, as well as uh, from our colleagues who are also testing out technology like this, uh, is that the messages are um, actually more compassionate, uh, a little bit longer than maybe the very over you know overworked, overburdened doctors uh, can can actually uh, you know draft on their own. Uh, so this is an example of of you know some of the things that that we're starting to look at, and certainly want to do a lot more. But uh, there's a lots of things that we have to do and we'll probably get into in this discussion about you know the the data that we have to use, how do we make sure we validate it first. Uh, as well as the, even the availability of compute uh, that you know is limiting sometimes some of the things that we we already dreaming of doing. And I just maybe maybe just start with just a quick level set of the audience. Show of hands, how many of you are involved in the delivery of clinical care? 
great. And how many of you are in Epic uh, at least once a week? Great. And how many of you do research that involves human subjects, but are not clinicians in any way? Okay, great. So I think a lot of these comments will, will resonate with you. I think another collaboration, um, and I think something that would not have happened had we not catalyzed this new uh, relationship between the school and the health system is uh, we just signed the contract yesterday, so hot off the press. We'll be, we'll be introducing in the next few months an ambient listening software solution that will enable a conversation in an office setting between a provider and a patient to be essentially instantly transcribed and formatted in the form of a traditional ambulatory encounter note during the visit itself using a foundation LL large language model that was developed by this uh, third party vendor, the, the uh, CEO and founder of whom is a cardio practicing cardiologist. Um, and it's really remarkable. It's actually, it's game changing. And it's game changing because I've followed this field for many years and I, every six months I sort of go in and dabble and it's like vapor, 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 terrible, 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 amazing. Like it was no evolution. There was no, li the linear evolution is gone. I think with what we're going to see with generative AI is exponential changes and then all sorts of off-target problems and other things we have to clean up. But the but the, the the leaps are happening in the in the space of months now, not years. And we think it's going to be transformative and we've been able to negotiate an enterprise license for this product. So the hope is that we'll have thousands of users on this product within a relatively short period of time, maybe a year or two. Um, we will need to determine how valuable it is. Uh, I have to say in my own uh, experience of testing it, it's been it's been remarkable how it ignores non-salient information. Oh, you know, it was really hard to get here this morning. It was so much traffic or, you know, I had to drop my son-in-law off at the doctor's office. That just doesn't show up in the note. Um, and, and you can actually adjust the settings uh, on these tools, you know, more verbose, less verbose, right? You can sort of have, you know, you can have pediatric neurologist, I'm a neurologist, pediatric neurologist style note or like orthopedic style note. You know, so you kind of uh, adjust the aperture a little bit. Um, but I, I do think that we, we have to be really thoughtful as we talk about the introduction of these tools already in radiology, by the way. Uh, these tools in radiology and cardiovascular care are already becoming part of clinical workflows. Uh, there's this concept of automation bias where because the computer told it to you, it somehow has more resonance, more value, more, more accuracy than your own judgment. And there's a really important study was published earlier this year. And, and Dr. Kara, who's in the audience, but not here right at this moment, wrote a nice editorial in JAMA. You take inexperienced, moderately experienced and expert mammographers reading breast imaging, and then you give them AI to enhance their diagnostic skill. The inexperienced raters jump up to near the level of experts. It's remarkable, right? They do really well. The moderate raters get a little bit of improvement. The experts have almost no improvement. But then you give them AI information that is deliberately wrong. It's completely designed to be biased. So it's wrong. It's not the right level of the of interpretation. And it has a huge impact on the inexperienced, as you wouldn't be surprised. But the experts go from 80% to like 50%. It has a profound negative impact on the expert rater. And what that means is we have to be really thoughtful, not just about the transparency of the AI outputs, but also of understanding the impact that that will have on the sort of human cognitive performance and influence the results. So again, doesn't mean we shouldn't do them. It just means that we need to fully understand the models and have ways of uh, assigning levels of confidence to the predictions so that the human readers don't overemphasize what could be an inaccurate or off-target response. Let me pause there and hand it over to Daniela. I think that that's uh, you know all terrific points, and it also uh, covers some of the opportunities that we have to work with people that are experts in implementation science and program evaluation in order to really understand how all these new tools are changing health outcomes, how we monitor their effectiveness over time, how we set up the right governance around these these kinds of new ways of of doing business and practicing care that allow us that allow us to 
take advantage of, I think, the fantastic expertise that we have across the school and the university more broadly in doing this kind of analysis. So it's not just creating the, the technology, which we've seen a lot of here, it's fantastic, but also really understanding the details of how does it get deployed, what's working, what's not working, is it actually improving the health of patients? Or if if we have a if we have a tool that is always right because it's telling someone to order every single diagnostic test possible. That's called a medical student. <laughs> they are all these different instruments. <laughs> so so yeah, I, I I I do think that you know some of these opportunities to combine the outcomes research and the types of the, the types of uh, epidemiological studies even that people have done are really starting to emerge as these new as these new things are being deployed and that is part of you know these kinds of collaborations that we, we have we, we have envisioned for the future is being able to do that kind of matchmaking maybe I'll, I'll add to you know to Daniela's point I think what's really exciting is all these technologies and things coming but also that we have a single integrated EHR system across our our health sorry entire health system so we've actually seven hospital campuses and I think over 350 different ambulatory sites, 1.1 million unique patients every year. That's a clinical laboratory for, I think, lots of amazing, you know, in vivo experiments and things that we can do as long as we do it in a secure, ethical way, of course. Um, but, but I think really powerful. And, and I think that's where we need to, you know, leverage all these extra clicks and things that we're forcing, you know, physicians and, and other clinicians to do in the EHR. Now that we can actually have it information digitized, now our job is to take it to the next level because what's actually happened is information overload, too much clicking, too much typing, right? Just taking away from that physician-patient interaction. I think many of you are, you know, are, are practicing physicians. And when you raise your hands, you know all too well how much that's, you know, sort of become a barrier between you uh, and and the patient. And I think, you know, what Dr. Schramm was sharing with, you know, with with the with the, with the ambient and some of these tools that we're now looking at, uh, I think it's a very exciting era that we're now entering. Hopefully, we can kind of just have that pendulum swim back to the other other way, where it's much more connected to the patient, and you're and you're actually harnessing that wealth information in in, in the right way. I'm wondering if Wade's ever going to get to ask question number two, but can I? <laughs> I just want to I want to make um I want to uh, follow on to what you're saying, which is there is really important foundational work in a couple of spaces, which is going to unlock enormous opportunity, and one of those is and it's work that uh, that Daniela is also deeply engaged in. It's thinking about structured versus unstructured data and actually transforming unstructured data into structured metadata or observations that can then be linked with the structured data. So unstructured data, an image, a chest X-ray. We have structured data in the report that the radiologist dictates, but the actual image that's captured in the, in the X-ray itself is unstructured. As we think about trying to transform those kinds of um, uh, data sets, into a standardized data model, not only at Yale, but across other healthcare systems, we start to unlock the power of understanding, do we treat acute kidney injury differently than, than other health systems? And if so, why? What is it about, is it just because we were taught by, you know, at Hopkins, they learned from Osler and he taught a generation and they taught the generation and these, these habits persist and maybe they're not actually effective? Or is it that, there are different populations or that the doctors trained in different places, but the opportunity here to really start to leverage a standard data model across multiple organizations with tools that let you query in real time is incredibly powerful. It doesn't tell you the right answer, but it will tell you what are the patterns of care that are out there. And we recently inked an agreement with Epic to become part of something they call Cosmos which is effectively using the EPIC standard data model. Now it doesn't include unstructured data, but for the structured data elements and access to over 200 million, I think it is. 220, 220 million patient records uh, to ask questions like with a patient who has these five comorbidities and these two you know, genetic uh, mutations, what is the most commonly prescribed antihypertensive antibiotic or you know, sort of like patients like the one in front of me? I think the opportunities for this are, are, are amazing. So there are foundational opportunities on the data transformation to get data into a format that can be readily uh, consumed. Then there are implementation challenges of literally just how do I get it into the workflow in a way that makes it easy to deliver? And then there are really exciting implementation science questions and, and health services research questions of 
when deployed does it act as as advertised you know your mileage may vary like how many miles per gallon are we getting out of this when we use it is it equitable is it achieving the, uh, the health outcomes that are desired not just the process steps that are desired and all of that is like two po1s and 25 ro1s like just on one topic alone yeah, that's all great. And given all these opportunities and tools that are coming online, uh, maybe Dr. Maker, you can start with, uh, you know, what are we doing to enhance the collaboration opportunities for people on the Yale side to either work with data from Yale New Haven or potentially deploy or use tools that have been developed uh, within the clinical setting? Thanks, Wade, for the opportunity. Um, so, so I, I think that actually uh, Lee just mentioned one big milestone, which is putting our data into the Cosmos ecosystem with many other uh, with many other healthcare systems that will allow uh, people to have much more accessible access to a really wide array of data for doing the kind of the kind of analyses that are fit for that for, are fit for that kind of space so it's it's going to be it's going to be the structured data that has been harmonized and has the limitations of not necessarily understanding the nuances of clinical workflow locally but that will be accessible. And if you were here this morning during Lucilla's talk, you saw that that's going to be accessible in a browser-like interface to anybody that is part of our, our uh, joint covered entity. Uh, so that's essentially virtually everybody that is one of the, in, in one of the clinical departments or someone that is sponsored by someone in those clinical departments. And uh, paired with that is a data science workbench that you can take a short class to participate in and You'll be able you'll be able to access the the row level data in a de-identified format that will really open up the possibility of working with this data to to people. And the training is actually pretty good for a two day course. I I think that you actually learn a lot about the principles of working with this kind of data and the limitations associated with it. So that's that's one of the early wins that 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 we had that should be a nice way to protect patient privacy in the Epic Enclave while opening up the, the resources um, to a broader group of people. And Wade and Charlie and, and Alan had set up a, a large computing infrastructure for us to do high performance work and we're turning the crank on the next generation of that um, with adding the GPUs. Again, Lucilla talked a little bit about that this morning, but I think some of the things that uh, have been really I would say a little bit of like in friction in the process had been related to creating the standard operating procedures, the uh, compliance sort of checklists and IRBs. So in addition to having one EHR, we all, as of I think last week, we also have one IRB and making, making that environment accessible and making data in that environment more accessible from a self-service standpoint so that people that have the right skills can can work with that data without having to without having to move it outside of the health system and that really puts us in in a in a place where we can have all of the great things that we get from working with the, even the even the un, even the unstructured data and all of the privacy concerns that comes with in a secure place where we have the higher performance compute options and so that's that's uh, something that we're you know rolling out slowly. I think there's about 34 people that have been using the self-service options in that environment. We've also created some lighter weight options for people that don't need the sort of very muscular uh, com computing, uh, collaborating with people that are managing the virtualized environment in the health system. And it's it's really been terrific to, to be able to work with the incredible IT talent in the in the health system. It's, uh, it's something that um, often doesn't get doesn't doesn't get acknowledged very well, but it's it's an incredibly talented and creative group of people focused on problem solving. And I would say that that's also true, almost uniquely of our of our privacy officers, the pe pe the people that are trying to help us through this. Um, you know, they they've been they've been uh, very engaged in trying to solve these problems. So I, I think that we're still sort of towards the tail end of a lot of resolving those problems, but it's uh, it's it's been it's been really interesting. And then the last thing that we are sort of just starting to do is trying to do this matchmaking process where we where we sort of identify needs and match them to to research opportunities. And uh, maybe we can talk about that a little later. I see that Lee has probably got some more to add. No, I, I think you 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 surface something that's really important, which is like constraints, right? And so how do we make sure that we give um, appropriate access in a way that doesn't feel, that feels unfettered, 
but is still within the the guardrails of keeping the patient data safe and the investigators safe. And I mean, the analogy that just occurred to me as you were talking is like a crosswalk. I park at uh, you know in the Howard Avenue garage. And I have to cross that you know street to get in, into uh, the Boardman Building every morning. And you know, most mornings I almost don't get killed crossing that street. <laughs> And uh, why do we have crosswalks? Because because crossing the street is dangerous and, you know, it's uncommon to get hit by a car, but it's bad if you get hit by a car and there's a little crosswalk thing and there's the light. And if you wait at the crosswalk and you wait for the light, your chances of getting run over are much lower. They're not zero <laughs> around here, but they're a lot lower, I've learned. Um, and that's sort of what the privacy office and the compliance piece and the, you know, the, the, the hospital firewall and the need to keep the data contained within a secure environment. It's really like a crosswalk so that you can access the data, access it reliably. And increasingly, as we talk about the power of this high compute environments, where you want to access hundreds of thousands or millions of records, the risks go up exponentially if you put that on thumb drive, right? Or, you know, it's on your laptop and you leave it on the bus or whatever it is. So there's a lot of work going on to really create safe, high compute environments in a virtualized environment so that we can bring people to the data and not constantly be creating copy downs of these enormous data sets to other locations. And then suddenly we have a huge storage costs on top of huge compute costs. It makes a lot more sense to try to bring people to the compute. Um, the other thing I was gonna say is there's some mundane stuff, the, like just the get rid of the stupid stuff that we've been working on very hard, we being all of us, which is make it easy for a Yale researcher who doesn't have an Epic login or a, a uh, health system identity access health system resources to apply for the data or submit the requests or respond to the queries because that's a that's like one of those catch 22s where you can't see the request unless you have an identity unless you have actually you know been identified previously as someone who was allowed to make a request it's like an endless circle and people just get frustrated and give up so there's some work that is being done it's not sexy but it's really important to like build those you know put the traffic light in and paint the sidewalk um but the the team here is doing an amazing job on that and that goes for the same thing with policies. You want to introduce, you want to bring data in or take data out to 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 uh, to do linkage. Someone has to review and approve that. And we, we're really trying to iron out the wrinkles of, is it both sides? Is it just one side? Can one side be a proxy for the other? So that the work of in the investigator community uh, doesn't have to recreate that wheel every time. And if there are questions or uh, other topics, again, feel free to come up to the microphones. Um, Dr. Shao and Dr. Schwann, maybe to start, uh, what are there maybe for potential opportunities to interact with vendors who do have AI products or algorithms, either to work through validation or maybe even offer potential tools or solutions that might be getting developed here within uh, our organizations? Before we take that? Yeah, like but, we, might yeah we can questions. start over here and then come back to that after. Is this a question about the previous or just about that? Oh, I think it was just an open question. Please, then. go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I think um, I'm Kieran Traga. Wait for a moment. Just tell us sort of who you are. Hey, yeah, I'm Kieran Traga. I'm the Chief of Surgical Oncology, and I've certainly enjoyed this, and I've met all of you in different forums. Um, I think the question I, I had was, I think this is a great venue to start something like this, and it's it's very exciting. And, you know, I'm sure there's the folks that are very already involved, and they understand this really well, and there's the folks perhaps who want to get involved. And I think the question I have for all of you is that, is there an opportunity for us to, to use this since this is new, uh, to break silos in some way so that folks can actually see what are people already doing? You know, has neurology already built an EHR registry that I can just mimic? Is radiology already doing radiomics that I can actually piggyback on? And our cardiology has already done this whole infrastructure for EKGs and how do we leverage the same thing? So. So what are your thoughts on how do we break the silo and kind of build this together and help people that are perhaps not quite at that sort of early adopter level, but sort of, um, or whatever, the innovator level, but coming at the early adopter? I'll, I'll answer that first from a kind of outsider's perspective, because I'm still, you know, more more outsider than insider, having only been here about nine months. And then I'll ask the, these guys to, to provide more more detail. This is, I think, not a unique problem to AI, right? This is a really a problem related to uh, research capability, to infrastructure, to adoption of you know new methodology. Um, a lot of young investigators who are not trained in statistics, they need biostatistical support or someone else, again, like you said, it's built a registry with all the EKGs of the organization already compiled, already cataloged. How do I access that, right? You know, why can't I access that? I think it really requires an institutional commitment to open science 
and a figuring out a way to um, offset the costs of what it took to build that particular module, that particular component, and figure out how to amortize that over the over the community. So you can build things faster, you can accrue capital faster together, and you, it doesn't become just your resource, you know. And right now, if you spent, you know, blood, sweat, and tears got three R O ones and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars building this thing, people feel uncomfortable about just then opening it up to everybody. But let's be really clear: patient data doesn't belong to anyone other than maybe the patient. So just because it's an EKG and you're good at EKGs doesn't mean you own that EKG, right? It really should be. It's available. It should be available to everybody. So we need to make sure that our systems can ingest that data, put it in a data model that makes it readily available, and then allow investigators who have appropriate, you know, IRB approved research to pull those down and 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 learn how to do this. Now, there's a separate question about how do we upskill the investigator workforce to be able to leverage these new tools. The exciting thing about the generative AI work in many ways is that it lowers the bar dramatically for engaging with high power compute so that you you start to get closer and closer to you know, the Star Trek of my childhood where you just talk to the computer and then it tells you back highly relevant answers. Um, so I think um, it's not a small challenge though. And I think it's as much a cultural challenge and cultural barrier as it is a technology one, but I'll let Dr. Shao give his thoughts. Yeah, um, Kieran, great, great to see you. And that's a great, really thought-provoking question. Um, and I, and I think Dr. Schwam, you know, certainly had some great points. And I think what I'm also hearing from you is just even like, how do we share great things that we're all doing in different pockets and things? And you know, at, during lunch, I was speaking to you know some of their faculty, and you know, I think we're just marveling at just how much brilliance there is here at Yale and all these amazing talks and people working on these just fascinating applications of technology and really innovative stuff and. I think one of the things of why we have a symposium like this is so we can start cross pollinating and start sharing, but how do we do that on a day-to-day -day basis? I think that's part of, I think, the Dean's vision to bring, you know, recruit Dr. Ono Machado here and 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 then having Danielle in the CRL role and having the, uh, you know, informatics department as I think I'm at least hoping, you know, that can start to serve as a nidus for folks who are these, you know, experts and wizards in AI and other, other technology things to start cross-pollinating there potentially. Uh, and then Danielle and I have been also, you know, kind of trying to brainstorm together. How can we work better together, you know, from a clinical informatics and a research informatics standpoint uh, and the health system uh, and Dr. Schwamp sort of alluded to it, you know, it's got lots of problems to solve, but also with limited resources. So that's, you know, over the past 10 years, no shortage of brilliant faculty coming to Charlie, to need to, to myself with, you know, great idea. But those great ideas need hundreds, if not thousands of hours of analyst time, you know, from JDAD or a application builder, or they don't understand, you know, all the security challenges that you would need to actually make something, you know, live in, in production. Um, so ideally, we bring these, you know, brilliant faculty who have great knowledge, want to solve problems. And then we also bring to them the problems that the health system is trying to solve. Lots of financial pressures right now. Our hospitals are full. Our EDs are full of patients who are, in, you know, boarded who have nowhere to go upstairs, as you know, Andrew knows all too well. Um, there's probably great technology and, and you know, informatics type of solutions to to some of those things to shorten length of stay to improve the quality and efficiency of care we give. Can we start harnessing uh, the brilliance that we have in our faculty in a really focused way to solve those problems? And then the resources, I think, will be more easily found because you're we're already trying to solve a problem that we need solved already on the system side. So I think a lot, uh, you know, for us to do over the next, you know, year or two to kind of try to codify that better. And I just want to make one other point, and it, it sort of anticipates the next question from Wade. We don't have a good, the market's not mature in this space. We don't have a good rip and replace layer where we can put in a tool, try it out, remove it. We can't just like plug it in. We have to spend thousands of hours of of integration time. There's no straightforward plug and play integration yet. I do think with this explosion of, of AI enabled tools, we are hopefully gonna to get to a point. Uh, for example, our ambient listening product is going to be plug and play for us because they worked with Epic to build the integration points. And now we just have to say, yes, pin number one goes into slot number five, You know, pin number two goes into slot number seven. That capability is really important because we're not gonna have 10 companies knocking at our door. We're gonna have a thousand companies, each with a point solution. 
acute kidney injury, you know, acute heart failure, uh, acute hyperglycemia, chronic hypokalemia. Everyone is going to want to build a point solution and sell that solution. And, and that's not going to be viable unless we have a swappable marketplace like, um, you know, the sort of clinical calculators, you know, Chad's Vask. Okay, so, you know, that's simple, right? That's just five variables you abstract from the chart. But if that is actually 150 variables and you need to pull all sorts of data, well, we need a layer, middleware layer that the EHRs, which is predominantly Epic for us, buy into and don't feel they're competing with it. There's actually creating additional value. And I think that's that's something that I've been, every time I speak at a in an industry setting or with my peers, I'm really trying to push on industry to start thinking collectively about building that middleware layer because it will benefit all of us. So we just want to respond to your, your your earlier question about sort of how do we how do we discover what we're doing and and put this together. So I I think that part of the opportunity through centralizing some of the, some of these services is actually the ability to collect data and uh, foster social networks between people that have data. I, some of the applications of AI are actually better curation of of data that you can actually directly attach to people that have similar interests that we saw earlier today, like a great sort of graph of all the different papers. Some of the, some of the way that was laid out is based on sort of citation networks, but imagine instead of citing only the papers to find your colleagues that are working on something, you can also look at what project were they working on in the very early phases? What data set were they were they working on? How did they define the cohort? And does that overlap with my clinical cohort or a trial or a study that I just cited in a paper I published? That that is actually a, a, a reasonably achievable goal, uh, if you know, even for a student doing on a summer project, if we have the data curated in a central way that allows us to to leverage those kinds of things. So I, I think I think the opportunities to you know even apply some of these things in that in that goal of creating the, the professional and social networks is it's a but nice. Who ran a query like me? Yeah, sort of. Exactly. Yeah. Another question. Uh, I, I want to thank the panelists for the important work they're doing um, in terms of, especially with middleware and standardization. This is very important in order to get full acceptance of generative AI and AI in general in healthcare. And I, I, I just want to thank you guys. Um, and, and then my wish list. Um, I wish for an open source clinical decision support AI model for edge compute devices. And I'm happy about the partnership with Epic Cosmos. I was wondering if there's any interest at Yale for leveraging um, function calling and LLMs to query Epic Cosmos in order to create synthetic synthetic databases for fine tuning open source foundational models for the sole purposes of creating these said um, open source uh, clinical decision support AI models. I'll, I'll take a little crack. First of all, thank you for the first uh, comment. And, you know, there's been a whole, um, uh, field with starts and stops around like the digital twin or, you know, synthetic clinical trials, you know, taking real patient data, hashing it, recombining it, creating artificial patients, but who have legitimate data. Now, that might not be legitimately interdependent data, right? Because if I have a deep vein thrombosis, you know, there's a whole perturbation in other systems that ought to go along with that. And when you create these synthetic patients, sometimes those relationships deteriorate, but they're better than just randomly created patients. And Part of what's important, as you're highlighting, is for open source, for foundation model building, to bring the cost of foundation model building down, you need highly curated, high quality data to train the, the generative models. And so one question is, can you actually create synthetic data that is that is good enough to train a model? Or does the uh, poison that you introduce when you create the synthetic model create these unrealistic relationships that then will will bias the model, right? And so that that's a really important problem. I and mean, that the acute kidney uh, injury team example is a good one. The questions you're asking are not just about the kidney system, it's about, you know, presence of heart failure and a perturbation of other labs. Well, if your synthetic data set doesn't adhere to those core principles, then it doesn't work. So the other thing you could say is, well, we're just not gonna, we're not gonna touch the data, we're just gonna swap out all the demographics. So instead of a 62 year old, you know, white man, you're gonna be a 71 year old Asian female. Well, there's still some of that problem of, of corrupting the data, but at least you're not, you're not introducing um, as much perturbation. Then we have all the challenges of re-identification. So the closer you are to the true data, the greater the risk of re-identification, especially when you can link um, probabilistically, not even deterministically to other data sets. I work in a very large uh, national database called Get With The Guidelines. It's a cardiovascular uh, and stroke database. I helped build the stroke version of it. We have 8 million patient records. 
It's totally de-identified, but it just turns out there just aren't that many strokes that happen at St. Mary's on the 4th of July, you know, to uh, a 62 year old person. And so we can get re-identification to Medicare. We don't know who the person is, but we can link determine probabilistically to Medicare with about 80% accuracy. So re-identification is a really important issue. I do think that we have to figure out how to make these data sets or high quality data sets publicly available. And there are some opportunities. NIH funds a lot of science and they currently require open, you know, open data. There are a lot of exceptions to that in, in clinical trials, but there could be ways of encoding that clinical data from the beginning that would allow you to create NIH, uh, essentially open source data sets for model training. I think it's a really important point. And I, I don't, maybe you guys have ideas about, you know, ways to address that challenge, but that's my thought. Or maybe Wade has thoughts on that. He's not just a uh, moderator. He's also uh, the president. No, 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 definitely just moderator over on the side. But <laughs> I, I mean, I agree very much with everything you said. I mean, there's been a number of companies that have popped up and depending on your year at HIMSS and uh, health, that's a, a different group with a different approach to synthetic data. And when trying to use it, we just have not seen that accuracy. And it takes very few data points to probabilistically re-identify um, some work we had actually done with Dr. Gershkovich, who was here earlier, at least uh, looking at even like pathology reports. If you have some of the notes, you can basically re-identify in the first seven to eight words of the note, even just because of the number of combinations that are there. So uh, I think some of the bigger areas to look at, like uh, what University of Florida has done with Gatortron, or how can we start to train and you know do some de-identification and then obscure some of the models so that we can potentially release open source foundation models, even though there may not be full access to the data sets themselves. And you know, you bring up a really important point about de-identification that I think is important. This, this audience needs to understand the nuances. There is a very straightforward superficial layer of de-identification that's a necessary layer, right? In the in imaging files, something called the DICOM, which is a digital standard for communications that lists, you know, name, age, scanner, you know, address, all that. So you wipe those out and you say, oh, I've de-identified the record. Well, you haven't, because the next layer in there are images that actually have information burned into them, like the like an ID badge, essentially part of the picture. So then you have to use another layer of de-identification that scans every image to make sure it's not a manually saved screenshot of a post-processed image, which then has the information baked into the JPEG, not the actual image source. And then you get to the third layer, which is, I don't know how many of you have looked at a coronal, this plane of acquisition, MRI, but the first two slices is a picture of someone's face. I mean, it's an incredibly accurate representation of the face. Well, that is easy to re-identify. So then you have to create algorithms that blur or distor disturb that superficial layer. And then of course, you know, not for clinical interpretation purposes, but for research so that that's no longer available. So you can see that the you know, the, the bigger these data sets are and the more broadly you make them accessible, the greater the risk of re-identification. And I think that, um, you know, this is, this has, uh, these things also have serious consequences. Uh, a nice example, this is Fitbit data. So you can share your Fitbit, it turns out, with your, with your group, right? You can compete, you can share your Fitbit data. Well, a group in Iraq was able to figure out, based on the soldiers wearing their Fitbit data, the timing of the patrols around the US bases in Iraq, not something that you want people to know. Um, so uh, we're just getting exquisitely capable of extracting information, actionable information from data. And so uh, this is why there is so much fuss about privacy around patient health data, where we really are, I think, are gonna have to build these models internal. We have to host internal secure instances of these foundation models and not let that data um, escape back into the main pond. Just described like 30% of my inbox for the, for the week there. Right? <laughs> uh, you said you were a compliance officer. <laughs> Hi there, first of all, thanks for everything. Uh, my name is Paris Mehta, I'm an internal medicine resident. Um, I had two questions real quick. Uh, the first one was more of a logistical question, clarifying. Is the portal that you were describing, the one that you've developed all the procedures for, um, then that we would be able to access um, access via the portal, was that local Yale New Haven Health data, or was that going to be Epic Cosmos data that we'd, we'd be able to access through those portals? Um, and then the second question was, 
you were talking about Dr. Schwann, you were talking about the, like a middle layer that allows for plug and play integrations of all these single, single problem solutions. Um, we're doing that, it sounds like with Epic uh, and the company that's, that has integrated um, just for note taking in Epic. It, do you see Epic or your EHR as that middle layer where everything will get plug and played integrated into? I, I th it's, a, it's a good question. I think it's a tug of war, whether it's going to be Epic or whether ONC or other government regulatory agencies are going to put some kind of a ring around the EHRs uh, for, for antitrust or anti-monopolistic uh, markets. This is a huge market, right? There's going to be a huge explosion of of wealth creation in this market. And it it is conceivable that a dominant EHR could lock everyone else out of the market or make it really anti-competitive. So I, I think there's it remains to be seen how that's going to play out. Um, I don't ideally think it lives in the EHR. I think it's a secondary marketplace, just like there's uh, the equivalent of um, the, the Epic App Orchard. But this isn't just um, as, sim as simple as that because these point solutions are, uh, depending on how deep of an integration they need, they may need a very light integration. They might not need this deep, expense, extensive, expensive integration, but we need uh, standards-based taxonomies and we need standard, it's sort of the equivalent of what happened with the electrical grid when we agreed we're gonna go alternating current and the plug's gonna look like this. Then there's no competition over who owns the plug or what the shape of the plug. That's just determined and regulated. And then everyone's like, okay, well, now I don't have to worry about that. Now I, now I don't have to worry about the plug and the wire. Now I just worry about the, my device. I think that's the kind of introduction of standards. And I, I think probably ideally by an in neutral, non-governmental third-party body like the WWW consortium did for the internet. Um, what was the first part of your question was about? The first oh, question well, was uh, the yeah. portal. Is that going to be Epic Cosmos or just like Yale New Haven Health Data? So there's, I think, a combination of those, right? There's Slicer Dicer, which is access to our own data set, unrestricted, um, but, uh, you know, with, with appropriate Epic um, credentials. And if it's research IRB approval, there's Cosmos, which takes you in that same framework, sort of Slicer Dicer on steroids, takes you across the universe of Epic sites. But then there are um, platforms that Daniela is trying to establish that would allow you to access whatever data you can bring into the system or whatever data is in the system wouldn't have to just be health data. Like you could be an environmental scientist and you want to link air quality with, uh, you know, heart failure admissions. So the the goal is to provide secure compute and storage space where you can do some of that work. You want to talk a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, sure. So, so I, I think that, that that's the opportunity is there. The, the Cosmos environment is a separate environment that actually has layers of de-identified data with these with these two different interfaces. But then in terms of using our own data that allows for some of these more detailed uh, kinds of questions, yeah, like row level data, also the you know, ability to link uh, with identifiers in a way that you can't in Cosmos. There's, I think Cosmos only lets you do state level. I don't even think you can do zip code level data there. So. The type of the, the type of analysis that you might want to do with our data set, I mentioned this this, this platform that's inside the health system that is you know part of what Lucilla referred to as the safe infrastructure, where we can deploy some of the systems that yeah again Wade and Wade and Charlie built log in uh, be able to specify the data set that you need link that back to your uh, IRB record and then get to work. With with a with a data set that has been cleaned and curated, uh, and can be augmented with more raw data if it's not part of the the curated part of, of that environment. And then there there's also lighter weight versions of that if you don't need the high performance compute uh, that looks more like, you know, launching a Windows a Windows VM that has all of the software that you need. So we went through and sort of picked all of the software that most data scientists would like in the libraries for Python and R and, and have that set up as well. So those those are those are tools that are available now. And um, I, I can point you to the details on that. I think that I think that what is missing and that we really need to work on is setting it up so this is a little bit more easily discoverable. That's true for the data sets as well. Like having that catalog of these are the these are the resources and Here's how we've, we've been so busy setting them all up <laughs> that we haven't that we haven't actually made it as as easy to find for people and, and you know from no matter where you're logging in from it should be it should be a little bit easier as it, that's that's part of that's part of our communication plan I think. I think there's something else that the, the 
a question from the front uh, had asked earlier, which is, you can sit down if you want, <laughs> uh, is uh, about edge computing. And I think this gets to the centralized versus decentralized high performance computing. If you're, if you're you know, trying to analyze 8 million records uh, with you know, 2000 variable interactions, you're doing high performance compute in a cloud-based storage environment. But there's a lot of stuff happening in the healthcare environment that would really lend itself well to edge computing, particularly the privacy preserving aspects of that. So a nice example would be um, having a camera turned on in the hospital room at all times. Nobody wants to be on camera 24 seven. Uh, it's creepy and it's, you know, it's distressing to people. We do procedures, people are undressed. We don't want that, but we might be very interested in movement, right? You move too much, that might be hyperactive delirium. You move too little, that might be critical illness or hypoactive delirium. It's probably not normal. There's probably a range of normal movement. And then there are other kinds of movement disorders, Parkinson's, tremor, other things that, again, we might readily be able to diagnose in a, a motion capture system that is not film and or video streaming. And you also don't want, with the 1,300 beds at, at the York Street SRC campus, you don't want 1,300 Vi live video streams traveling across your network 24 seven. That's a huge bandwidth drain. You'd much rather re you know, perform edge computing inside the detector sensor device and then stream you know, an eight bit stream you know, to centrally to somewhere or even store it locally and execute algorithms locally so that it alerts the nurse when the threshold hits, right? So I think what you're probably gonna see is a push pull. You're gonna build algorithms, you're gonna detect, you're gonna learn you're going to find solutions, then you're going to push them forward and package them into algorithms for edge computing. And then you're going to learn from that. And then you're going to take in more data. And then you're going to do maybe even some more edge computing on the metadata. And I think that's how you'll drive efficient computational efficiency and temporal resolution, which we, we don't have right now. Great. And uh, so I guess uh, going back to a, a little bit of a hybrid of the uh, prior question I was starting with uh, is... So when we are engaging vendors and or people want to work with vendors or these vendor systems, uh, what are the pathways to explore, look at those options, as well as what do we do for verifying data quality in something like Cosmos or Slicer or Dicer to make sure that users are getting the results that are expected and not something that might be erroneous or misleading? Is the chief apology officer? <laughs> I, I was kind of thinking that. Uh... <laughs> uh, I mean, um, this is really hard and it's getting harder. And, uh, you know, partly it's that we live in a resource constrained world, but it's also there just isn't enough time and money and people to do like every clinical, every flavor of a clinical trial that you wanted to test, you know, is aspirin or anticoagulation better in this population? Well, you can't have a separate clinical trial for the people who are, you know, also have heart failure, the people who are left-handed, the people who were born in another country but are living here now, the people who live in the top floor of their building, the people who live in the basement. Like there's so many variables. We rely on randomization, uh, you know, and heterogeneity effects to demonstrate whether the drug has an effect on the class. If it doesn't, then we have to narrow down and narrow down and the indication gets smaller and smaller and the treated population gets smaller. We kind of have the same problem here. I mean, right now, I think we have five or six different ambient solution-like offerings from different companies, all of whom have found a faculty member as their sponsor and want to get in the door free, right? It's free, meaning you can use the service for six months for free, but not the integration costs, not the training, not the education, not the exit cost of taking it out again. How do we, how do we know what the right choice is? How do we, how do we try to move the field toward platforms? I mean, the great thing about generative AI is a platform, right? It answers, LLMs answer questions about, you know, Shakespeare and about kidney failure. Same model, like it's pretty amazing. We don't can get that for everything, but where can we build platforms, not point solutions? Because point solutions are inherently very high performing in that one highly specific domain and perform poorly in other domains. And the value there, I think is just not present unless it's a really rare disease or it's a really, really common problem so that the point solution still has extraordinarily broad applicability. But I'll let Alan tell you which uh, Swiss bank account to send the money to to get your LLM uh, introduced. I, I was thinking Bahama, something warmer, but, um, but uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, Dr. Schwamm has some great points and I, I was just thinking out loud, you know, about that great, great question, the way to answer or ask. And, 
that is the problem is that we have no shortage of folks who want to come and are offering you know some you know, something amazing sounds too good to be true and it's free and um i think the analogy made was made early this morning and i've heard it before too that how data is the new oil right and so we have oil and people want to come drilling here at yale uh and they'll they'll find any way to get their foot in the door. And I think one of, you know, our, you know, I'm sure our chief technology officer, Glenn Stanton and Lisa, you know, our CIO and some of our worst nightmares are we have, you know, countless number of, you know, different vendors all trying to inter 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 interface with Epic, not because we don't want to, but you have to remember there's a cost to everything, you know, as, as Lee was mentioning. Uh, and also, you know, Epic itself is trying to, um, constantly improve the system so that they have four upgrades four new versions coming out every year we typically upgrade two versions at a time but so every time something gets upgraded things stop working right we all have you know many of you have you know iphones and i'm sure androids as well uh, a lot of times those old apps stop working uh, and even the new app doesn't work quite as well if you do go to the trouble of downloading it but now imagine you have these clinically critical systems that are interfacing with epic and you know, we already have hundreds of them, but now if you make the thousands, that's 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 a nightmare with every upgrade that we have to try to maintain, make sure it doesn't break. Uh, and these are real patients that we're taking care of with these systems. So I think I get back to one of my thoughts was, you know, if it, if there's, you know, a, maybe help the, the system, health system solve problems the health system really needs to solve. Um, and I think to Lee's point, if there's more platform solutions that, that you know, a platform or, or a company that can solve multiple problems that's much more, I think, scalable than these one-offs, which unfortunately there's just too many of. They focus only on, you know, you know, all the all the pathology of the right toe. Someone else is just doing, you know, just left corneas, and you know, those systems are just so specialized that that's just not sustainable for for healthcare systems to to maintain. I, when you said about drilling for oil, I was thinking, uh, yes, and we have to avoid the oil spill, uh, which is when the uh, poorly functioning equipment lets all the oil leak out on the ground. Um, every time we integrate a, a third party vendor that has access to our actual identified data stack, we are at risk for breach. And, and you know, big, successful, highly reliable companies have been breached. It is not something that just happens to Johnny come lately. Um, we have a question. Yeah, I just have a follow up to that very important uh, conversation. So I think the uh, I totally agree. These point solutions a little closer to the mic. Okay. So the point solutions that we're discussing actually are probably infeasible for, and they're going to be just exploding because every startup company has a product that they want uh, integrated. They need one customer to go to the VC and say we've got one someone. The only challenge that I, I think uh, there's a disconnect between what is feasible on the health system side and what is approved by the FDA or cleared by the FDA. Because the FDA actually wants to clear only point solutions. They want a product, defined AUC, this tool and this product. How do we reconcile those two like completely discordant like realities from what FDA wants to clear in this domain? So Rohan, I, I think, and you can stay at the mic if you want, but I think the solution there is what I said before, which is the middleware layer. Because if we had a reliable middleware layer and we could literally just say to the vendor, yeah, plug into the bus. Your job when you build your product is to conform to the bus. Here's the bus and the bus can link you to Cerner. It can link you to Epic and it's Epic and Cerner's jobs <clears throat> to keep the bus upgraded when they, they have to grandfather in certain standards. You know, once those are baked, then they don't have the luxury of just saying, oh, we're not compliant with that standard anymore. I think without that middle layer, you, we have the problem that you just said, which is FDA doesn't want to approve a magic pill that solves all, you know, heart failure, heart attacks and strokes, right? They, they want to, a pill for a specific indication. They want a tool, software tool, as or software as a medical device for a very specific narrow indication. Well, I think GPT-4 is a great example now because you want GPT-4 integrated. We want it integrated to allow us to do disease discovery. What will count as a successful disease? Is it the entire platform that's approved that we can discover any disease or only stroke is discovered or only uh, missed, missed MI is discovered? I think that's the problem that what will the FDA regulate is unclear because the bounds of performance are not well defined. Uh, no, I mean, sorry, I, this was more like, I don't know the solution. I just really wondered if people did. It's a market disconnect. I mean, it's a really profound one. And until it gets fixed, nothing works. It's just like reimbursement. You have the best drug in the world. If no one pays for it, no one gets it. And so those systems have to align for us to really achieve this value. And we can't wait. I mean, this is urgent. This should be like, this is a national defense priority. It's at that level because the amount of money we're spending for the healthcare return we're getting is not sufficient. 
And so this this really needs to be a priority. I think it is a priority, but the risk with the Biden executive order and all that is that the concerns to tamp down the risks in defense and you know other other issues on AI may inadvertently trigger further regulatory barriers rather than facilitators. Thanks. And we only have a couple of minutes left, but maybe just going to one of the points that's been brought up a couple of times with the middleware is that, you know, in theory, at least we have fire, which has, you know, limitations, but is also required. Uh, what are we seeing from Epic either on the, you know, maybe Danielle on the research side and then Lee and Alan on the clinical side of what are they really enabling? How are we pushing to prioritize that and actually make that middleware that is theoretically required actually accessible? I, I just want to call out Nitu because she's done so much great work in, in this space. But I, I I think that this is kind of stitches together with some of the things that you were asking about before, which is, you know, it's required to be there, but the quality of the data that is surfaced there and the extent to which you can interface that with workflow is much more limited than than what's theoretically possible with the Fire APIs. Uh, so I've I've done a couple of studies, Nitu has done a couple of studies trying to integrate these great new tools that can apply not not even not even ai like just really simple decision rules uh, and it's very difficult to get things into workflow to get things back into the system but part of it is just human behavior and how they get used to using a platform but part of it is the quality of those of, of the way the data is surfaced and the way that you can get things back in and i think that while there are standards for a lot of these middleware components, the standardization and the extent to which the data is where it's supposed to be to make that work is very different from what Epic ships to your site. And same with Cerner and how things actually get implemented when you've gone through the sausage factory of like setting it up for each clinical department and hospital service. So I, I think that is one of the challenges of staying conformant to that vision of plugging it into the to the outlet. I, I could not agree more. I mean, and if you look at the difference between the public fire APIs, which are mandated to be free and readily available, and you compare that to the private APIs, which you pay an arm and a leg for uh, with Epic. I can't speak to Cerner because I've only done it with Epic, but it's like um it's like a, a Volkswagen Beetle versus a Lamborghini. The, the they're they are able to make these fire APIs highly flexible, highly capable. But they believe that that's uh, a you know material work that needs to be reimbursed, and the the rates that they charge for those APIs are so substantial that unless you're doing very infrequent queries on very small amounts of data, you 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 basically can't build a sustainable business model against that. And any third party vendor that does has no guarantee that the private API set is not going to be changed in the future, especially if Epic, and I don't mean to bash Epic, but the EHR vendor decides they wanna offer that service themselves. And so again, it comes back to what I said before, we really need like a national library standard of these fire APIs. And we need a third party neutral group, not just defining what APIs could be, but actually requiring that, nope, I'm triggering Dan Daniela here, but just requiring yeah, well, that they okay. be, you know, <laughs> like, uh, you know, enforceable. If only CMS would enforce the the conformance to these standards, and as a condition for payment, uh, they, they have the standard, and ONC is supposed to be that body that regulates regulates things. But until somebody's paying for it, nobody's it's it's, it's where the money is. And uh, we're at our time for the coffee break, but uh, thank you to the panelists. If there are some additional questions, maybe uh, they'll be able to stick around for a few minutes just to answer those individually. Um, Andrew, anything you wanted to say before? Okay, perfect. And we'll be back at 3.30.